I'm uh, Arjun Parisher. I'm one of the rhinologists down at the University of South Florida uh, here in Tampa. And we're going to talk a little bit about approaches to the cella, the supercella, and the paracellar skull base. Uh, we're going to go over a lot of material here. Some of it may be basic, kind of um, looking at uh, sort of traditional approaches and anatomy, uh, kind of moving to more complex uh, topics later. Feel free to stop me with any questions uh, you have. Um, you know, we'll try to keep an eye on, uh, on that and answer them as we go. Or also at the end, we'll have time for some questions. And you know, just given the fact that there's maybe people from all sorts of different programs and different years um, who may have different levels of exposure, uh, my hope is, is that for the junior residents, this kind of piques your interest in endoscopic skull base surgery and uh, gives you a basic uh, primer of some of the anatomy um, and possibilities. And then for the kind of more senior residents, uh, really helps you with uh, kind of some of the more advanced approaches like the transterogoid and temporal fossa uh, stuff that we're gonna get into. So um, we'll first start off with the nasal septal flap, which is kind of the workhorse reconstruction uh, method that we use. And it's a flap that either it's uh, preservation or harvesting it is uh, a key step in a lot of the approaches. We'll then do a basic approach to the cella, which is very common and it's probably the most common thing that you guys have seen uh, for any pituitary pathology. We'll then do a supercellar approach. Um, with a case example of a craniopharyngioma there. Uh, this is mainly used for craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas. And then we'll do a transterogoid approach, um, which is used for anything lateral that we need to do uh, to get into, whether it's a JNA or infratemporal fossa. Uh, we'll have a couple case presentations of that as well. So the nasal septal flap. The first thing to know about the nasal septal flap, uh, the key here is the, uh, the vascular supply. So, you know, we're all familiar with the anterior ethmoid artery, the posterior ethmoid artery. And, but the main thing that we're concerned about here, this is a sagittal view, obviously, of the nasal septum here. Here you can see the sphenoid. Is this branch from the sphenopalatine? So the internal maxillary artery gives off the uh, the sphenopalatine, and then it, that get, has a posterior septal branch, which traverses here just inferior to the sphenoid, and that vascularizes our nasal septal flap to allow us to have a vascularized flap that we can then keep pedicled uh, for reconstruction. So just understanding that that's the artery that we are looking to preserve um, is key. So here we have an illustration um, looking here, we see here's the coena. We have the nasal floor to orient you. Here's the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, the superior turbinate, and here's the sphenoid ostium. So the posterior septal branch is going to, so from the internal maxillary artery here, you're going to have the sphenopalatine. This posterior septal branch is going to come across here and vascularize the nasal septum somewhere below the sphenoid ostium and above the coena. So here you can see the kind of um, highlighted here, the, the cuts of what will be our, our sphenol, uh, our nasal septal flap, okay? And that's all done to preserve this vessel here uh, that's traveling somewhere here. Here's another illustration that shows it. Here you, they've actually kind of shown that vessel traversing here. Again, here's the coena, here's the floor, the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate. So there's our vessel, and you can see there's one cut made superiorly just below the sphenoid ostium, and one that's made inferiorly at the coena. And so here they basically show the, you know, you could do a regular flap, which is just sort of at, we make the inferior cut at the junction between the nasal septum and the floor, or we can do an extended flap where you come all the way underneath the inferior turbinate uh, and take this mucosa of the nasal floor as well. So you can have a a wider flap uh, for your more expanded cases. And then in the bottom picture here, you can see once the cuts are made using a caudal or freer to elevate that um, mucoperichondrial flap off of the nasal septal bone and cartilage. 
So this is a sagittal view uh, showing the cuts and you can see coming in fairly here up along the floor. But the main thing I wanna show with this image here is that that initial cut is, we come straight uh, out horizontally and then we move up to widen our flap. And the reason for that is a couple things. One is in order to maximize the maneuverability of the flap, we want this area that we're preserving just purely for the pedicle to be narrow. That'll give us the most maneuverability in terms of getting this back. You know, here you can see the sphenoid sinus, here's the clivus, um, the cella obviously with the pituitary, so to allow us to get back to these regions, to allow us to cover the anterior cranial fossa, to allow us to reach a little bit up here to the posterior table of the frontal sinus to get back to the clivus. So you wanna keep this thin. The second reason um, for this sort of straight horizontal cut rather than going straight up right away is to preserve any of the olfactory fila and, this, um, and as much smell as we can up here, okay? And so that's important. And then the reason we head up here is that we want the area that's gonna be part of the major part of the flap, which is gonna be used for the reconstruction, we want that to be as wide as possible. So what's important, another thing to note here is that when we do a uh, simply a rescue flap, which is where we want to preserve the vascular pedicle without raising this entire flap, we'll simply make this horizontal cut and then push the mucosa down with a freer or a caudal, thus ensuring that we've preserved this vessel. And then we can microdebreed and remove this portion of the septum to create our posterior septectomy to give us the binostral view into um, the cella. So that's just an, another important thing to know that this horizontal cut allows us to preserve that flap, uh, the vascular pedicle, and to complete our posterior septectomy. So let's get started with the approach to the cella. So here, just to orient again, the first thing, uh, this is the coena, here's the nasal floor, the nasal septum, the middle turbinate, the inferior turbinate. And the first thing, We'll do is that we are trying to go transnasal and get back to the sphenoid. So I'll lateralize the inferior turbinate with a freer. We'll then lateralize the middle turbinate. Then that'll expose our superior turbinate, which will lateralize. And then I'll stick a kind of an epi soaked uh, cotinoid or pledget back here uh, to let that sit and I'll do the same procedure on the other side. Now, once we've done that, um, I can see then again, just to orient you, here's the coena, here's the nasal septum, the sphenoid ethmoid recess, here's the superior turbinate, and here's the sphenoid ostium. So as we mentioned before, that this posterior septal branch is gonna run somewhere between the inferior portion of the sphenoid ostium and the coena. So when I'm doing a rescue flap, which is the major thing that we do for pituitaries or cellas, uh, cellar approaches, we don't always need it. Uh, sometimes if we don't have a leak or if it's a low flow leak, so I don't wanna go through the time of raising the entire flap, we'll make this cut just below with a needle tip cautery, just below the sphenoid os and come again horizontal on the nasal septum to about halfway up the, towards the middle turbinate. And so here you can see this uh, incision being extended uh, halfway up to the middle turbinate. And then I'll be able to push that mucosa down to preserve uh, the vascular pedicle in here. And then I can complete my posterior septectomy. So again, this is just showing that we made that horizontal cut here. So once I've made that horizontal cut, I can then, as we said, micro breed and use a through cutter to remove the posterior septum, and then open the sphenoid widely on either side. You can see here that my mucosa has been pushed down uh, here, preserving my uh, vascular pedicle to the nasal septal flap on both sides. This is the floor of the sphenoid sinus. This was the inferior portion of the, you know, the rostrum uh, of, of the, uh, sorry, the, of the septum. 
So we've done our septectomy. We're now able to look at this. We've opened up with a kerosene widely the sinusitis on both sides. We're now looking at the rostrum, which then you can use a downbiting kerosene um, and through cuts or a drill to remove this. So now we've removed that uh, rostrum. We're now looking at the inner sinus septum. And there's the cella in the background. I use a high speed uh, diamond drill, usually a three millimeter high speed diamond drill, either on like a Midas Rex or on your Medtronic shaver to drill back this inner sinus septum. And once we've done that, you know, you have nice binostral exposure uh, of your cella. So this is obviously here in a, in a cadaver, just showing you guys a well pneumatized um, sinus, just the anatomy. So down here would be the sphenoid floor. Here's the clivus. Here's the cella. This is where our pituitary gland is. Coming up here, this will be the tuberculum. And this will be the planum sphenoidale. That's the kind of the roof of the sphenoid sinus. That'll be important for when we get into the supercellar approaches. You see the optic nerve here on both sides. And then importantly here, you see the carotid artery. And this is gonna be something that we come back to um, throughout our talk. So you have the vertical clival carotid here. It then turns towards us, up, and then back in. And this will be the paracellar carotid, okay? So it's important to know that it comes up, comes towards us, goes up, and then goes back in intracranially. And here you can see the double asterisk is the lateral optical carotid recess, and this is the medial optical carotid recess, okay? So this is sort of our well pneumatized sinus, our basic anatomy. But when we're doing a cellar approach for the pituitary, this is what we're focused on, okay? So that's the basic way to get back to your cella. Now, when we do a supercellar approach, we do a little bit uh, more. So rather than going transnasal, just pushing the turbinates aside, um, you know, sometimes for exposure, we'll resect the right middle turbinate in the traditional cellar pituitary approach, as the neurosurgeons want it. But when we're doing an expanded approach, you know, supercellar, uh, anterocranial fossa, I usually want to create more room. So I'll do a bilateral maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoidotomy just to start off to kind of create room. We'll resect the, you know, the left or right middle turbinate as needed based on where the pathology is. And then we'll do that same um, nasoceptal rescue flap or elevation of the flap, depending if we already know we're definitely going to need it and perform that posterior septectomy. So the only additional step here is, like I said, we do the maxillary, ethmoid, and sphenoid um, dotomy, but then the posterior septectomy and the elevation of the nasal septal flap are the same as we do for the cellar approach. So this is the same image that we looked at in the, with the cellar anatomy, again, the clivus, the cellar floor, the, the vertical clival component, uh, the carotid heading back, the optic nerves. So before we were focused on this area, on this image on the right, we've just shifted our view, our camera up. So here's the cella floor, here's the tuberculum cella, and here's the planum cella. Here, you can see this will be the bone right here is sort of demarcating um, uh, from where the sort of sphenoid roof and the ethmoid roof begin. Here's the posterior ethmoid artery. Here's the optic nerve here. You can see the carotid protuberance going in. It's, you can see it well over here, carotid protuberance and the optical carotid recess. So for a supercellar approach, this is mainly used for pathology such as a craniopharyngioma, um, can be used for some cases for a Rathke's cleft cyst, for meningiomas. The area of bone removal is now outlined here. This is the bone that we want to remove to be able to access this. So where for a pituitary, the cellar bone removal was down here. We've now shifted that upwards and we've now outlined the bony removal that we want for a supercellar approach. So once we've removed that bone, again, this is a cadaver specimen. We've drilled away all this bone. 
You've got the clivus down here. This was the cella, this is the pituitary gland, and this is the supercellular area. We've now incised the dura, and you can see the uh, optic chiasm here. You can see the superior hypophyseal artery. Back here will be the pituitary stalk. You have the optic nerve here on either side. We have our internal carotid artery. Again, you can see that it's gonna be coming up here, then come anteriorly, move up, go up superiorly, and then head back in towards the uh, intracranial cavity and the optical carotid Here's just a more close-up view looking intradurally there. You can see the optic nerve, uh, the optic chiasm, the superior hypophyseal artery here, pituitary stalk. Um, and then this is what I was talking about. This is the car carotid artery here heading back. And the first branch off superior inferior, uh, superiorly here will be the ophthalmic artery. You can see the optic nerve there, and this will be the ophthalmic artery. Okay, so just an important, uh, as we're doing our supercellular dissection, important uh, anatomy to be aware of um, as we head intracranially. So again, this is after bony removal and incising the dura, what we'll see. So just a quick case presentation here. Here's a supercellular craniopharyngioma. Um, extending supercellar here. This is a T1 uh, MRI coronal image. Um, we can see here, this will be our sphenoid and then our supercellar mass right here. Here's our carotids on either side. We can see now the cystic component of the craniopharyngioma. And this is a sagittal view showing, again, this will be the nasal cavity. Here's our sphenoid sinus, the sphenoid floor, the clivus, the cella, as we talked about. And this will be the tuberculum and the planum uh, sphenoidale. And here's our mass, okay? So in this video, I'm gonna skip ahead the, I've skipped ahead the um, kind of the, uh, sorry, man. So we see here's the left nasal cavity, here's the right nasal cavity. I'm gonna skip ahead and already have done the maxillary ethmoid and, and the sphenoidotomy. Here I'm raising the septal flap with the bipolar, I mean with the uh, electropottery and a caudal. We now remove that to the side and do a posterior septectomy. And now here you're left with the kind of binostral view. Here's the inner sinus septum, right? We've completed our posterior septectomy. Here's the inner sinus septum. This will be the left sphenoid. This will be the right sphenoid. But we've opened up widely. We've done our maxillary ethmoid and sphenoidotomy. Now I wanna kind of take down this, sorry about that. Take down this uh, inner sinus septum. So I removed that. I'm now gonna drill back that inner sinus septum to expose my cella and supercellular bone. So I'm going to thin that bone out, right? Here will be the cellar floor. This will be, so now with the kerosene, we're removing the bone overlying the cella and the supercellular region to expose the dura. So now this is the dura exposed. So where neurosurgeon will come in, they'll sort of cauterize uh, the dura, incise it, make sure to lift uh, now they've incised the dura and you can see the underlying mass here. This is the craniopharyngioma. We can see here the optic nerve here that's kind of been uh, splayed and causing some of the vision loss. So because it was a big cystic component, we're gonna incise this craniopharyngioma and remove the cystic component so we can decompress it. As we've decompressed it here, we can see um, Sort of there's, like I said, the uh, resecting it, kind of doing a sharp dissection there off the optic uh, nerve. Here we see, I'm, I was right here one second. This is kind of an interesting anatomy there. We can see the um, uh, anterior uh, cerebral artery. This is the A1 segment, the A2 segment. Here's the anterior communicating artery. So we're moving that 
the tumor off those arteries, the vessels, we're moving it off the left optic nerve there. Now when the tumor has been completely mobilized, you can go ahead and remove it. And looking in, you can see uh, the underlying anatomy, put some fat in. fascia as an underlay underneath the dura. Put a little bit of dura seal around the edges. Dura seal and then the nasal septal flap which we had rotated it, which we had raised in the beginning and stored in the nasopharynx, we rotated into place. Okay. So here you can see a sagittal T1 image with contrast. You see this is where the mass was before. We've had a Gross total resection. We've got this is uh, some of our fat uh, that we placed into that cavity, and the enhancing area here. This would be our nasal septal flap, which is recreating that um, uh, is that reconstruction there. So again, this is a pre-op image. Here on the left, we can see the mass, and here we see after resection with the nasal septal flap uh, in place. So that's sort of the supercellar uh, approach. So next I want to get into this trans approach or that it's kind of the mainstay of if we want to do anything lateral in the lateral plane. And this can be to access, um, you know, the nasopharynx or eustachian tube, the pterygopalatine fossa, the infratemporal fossa, the middle cranial fossa, or the paracellar region, the lateral sphenoid recess, for, so for all that. So this image here, this arrow here just shows that we are, um, everything we've done so far has been staying midline. We stayed, we went straight back along the septum to get to the cella. We looked upwards from there to get to the supercella region. So everything has been in this midline plane. But what happens if we want to come lateral to start accessing pathology, right? And as I said, this can be for the pterygopalatine fossa, this can be for the infratemporal fossa, the middle cranial fossa, the paracellar region, or lateral sphenoid recess. And so that's where we need to use these trans approaches. And there's a number of different ways to, to do this, and that's what these, this diagram is showing. This uh, right here is the sublabial approach, or a Caldwell luck, looking to come under the lip, doing a transmaxillary to get access to this area. Um, here uh, we see an approach, this will be th through a uh, medial maxillectomy or a Denker's uh, maxillectomy to get access to this lateral area. And then this over here is a transeptal approach coming from the contralateral side, making uh, a septal window to allow you more exposure to come to the lateral, uh, to come more lateral. So the main thing to think about is that so far we've been whatever we've shown is coming midline. And these are all approaches coming laterally as um, for any sort of pathology that's the lateral of midline. So just to go over the pterygoid anatomy, this is a coronal CT scan. Um, looking back, uh, we have here sort of the left sphenoid, the right sphenoid, the inner sinus septum, right? This will be the sphenoid roof. We have the optic nerve. We have the internal carotid artery coming here. We have foramen rotundum or V2. We have the vidian canal where the vidian nerve will come through. And so it's very important to understand this relationship between the vidian and foramen rotundum. So V2 and foramen rotundum will always be superior lateral to the vidian nerve. Okay. So it'll always be up and lateral uh, compared to the vidian. Here we have sort of the pterygoid wedge. And in that is usually where we have our vidian, then our V2. You can see that the vidian is in line with the medial pterygoid plate. And V2 is in line with the lateral pterygoid plate. Okay. So the asterisk here shows a lateral sphenoid recess. Can see that there's asymmetric pneumonization of this sphenoid. So there's on this left side, there's a 
uh, lateral sphenoid recess. On the right, less so, right? And so here's our vidian here, and here's our um, V2 coming here through foramen rotunda. The lateral sphenoid recess is important because we get a lot of um, encephalocele's, particularly in benign intracranial hypertension. Kind of the first, most, uh, the most common spot is in the cribriform. The next spot here will be sort of in this lateral recess, the sphenoid, just lateral to foramen rotunda. Um, and we're going to show a case example of that. So it's important to note here that, you know, if you're trying to get to this lateral recess of the sphenoid for any pathology, you would drill out the pterygoid wedge here between V2 and frame rotundo. If you're trying, here's the inferior turbinate, if you're trying to access pathology down here in the pterygopalatine fossa, you possibly want to drill out the medial pterygoid plate. If you wanted to get behind the medial pterygoid plate to the eustachian tube or the nasopharynx, or if you're doing a partial eustachian tube resection, you drill out this medial pterygoid plate. If you want to get out to the infratemporal fossa posteriorly with a lot of uh, pathology there, you'd want to drill out the lateral pterygoid plate. Uh, foramen ovale with V3 will come out just lateral to the lateral pterygoid plate. So you'll get some lateral pterygoid, so you'll get some infratemporal fossa V3 schwannomas in this area. And in that case, you usually hug the lateral pterygoid plate kind of drill to remove that bone to give you access so you can access the, the schwannoma there, okay? So again, everything we've talked about so far has been here, midline, here's the inner sinus septum. We've looked at getting to the cella, the supercella area. Now we're talking about accessing pathology in this lateral realm here, okay? And this will be what we call the paracellar space. So this is just another diagram to kind of show you um, the anatomical boundaries. So here we have the sinonasal tract. This will be the sphenoid up here. We have the medial pterygoid plate. We have the lateral pterygoid plate. We've got the vidian nerve and foramen rotundum with V2. So if we want to access the lateral recess of the sphenoid, so what I was saying is we'll drill this pterygoid wedge sort of between the vidian and V2. If we want to access the pterygopalatine fossa, the eustachian tube, the nasopharynx, we want to drill below that, these pterygoid plates, below, just below the lateral recess of the sphenoid. If you want to get into the middle cranial fossa, you'll want to go lateral to V2 or foramen rotundum. If you want to, and then the infratemporal fossa will be just below that. So those are sort of our boundaries. Uh, I hope that kind of helps uh, explain the anatomy of the pterygoid a little bit. So for an approach to the pterygopalatine and inf infratemporal fossa, as we had talked about, there's a number of ways to start that approach. You can use a Caldwell luck or a sublabial approach. You can use a Denker's approach. Um, you can do a transeptal. I'm just gonna go over kind of the mainstay workhorse, which is an endoscopic medial maxillectomy. So after you made your wind your maxillary uh, sinus, uh, you then proceed to resect the inferior turbinate and then cauterize the posterior stump. So here we can see in a patient here, this is the left side, we've got the coena, the nasal floor. Here's our maxillary sinus, which has been widely opened. The inferior turbinate has been resected and cauterized. We're now drilling down the inf uh, inferior portion of the medial wall of the maxillary sinus to maximize our exposure here. And so this is a common approach that's used even for, you know, um, if you need it to make a mega entrostopy, if you have inverted papilloma, um, it's pretty simple. You just make a big maxillary entrostomy, resect the inferior turbinate, and then drill down the floor uh, of the uh, inferior portion of the medial maxillary wall. Uh, so once we've done that, we're now looking in, this is our maxillary sinus that we've opened up widely. Um, we're going to remove the mucosa off the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, use a drill, a kerosene, and a curette to sort of thin out that bone and remove it uh, on the posterior maxillary sinus. Let's see, we have a question here. So, um, 
we have a question here about what happens with the nasal lacrimal duct with the medial maxillectomy approach. Is that sacrifice? So that's a really good question. Let me uh, see if I can go back here. So you have a couple options with it, and it sort of depends on the extent uh, that you need. So in a traditional approach where you're just maybe trying to access the pterygopalatine ter fossa, um, you'll just remove the bone in front of, sort of just posterior to the nasal lacrimal duct. Uh, and inferiorly, you can come down low, below where the nasal lacrimal duct uh, opens at Hazener's valve. So you can preserve and leave it in its bony covering in the majority of cases where you don't have to um, need that as wide of an exposure. If you need a wider exposure to and the bone here is obstructing you and you need to get out lateral or in some cases of um, tumor where maybe the nasal lacrimal, uh, the tumor is far lateral, what you can do is you can skeletonize the nasal lacrimal duct and removing eggshelling and removing the bone and then lift the duct out um, from its bony covering to preserve it and then remove the remaining lateral wall of, uh, sorry, the, the remaining medial wall uh, of the maxilla to give you additional uh, room and preserving the duct. In some cases with say um, a uh, inverted papilloma or malignancy that's involving the nasal lacrimal duct, you'll just sharply cut the nasal lacrimal duct. And if you do a sharp uh, cut through the nasal lacrimal duct, the rates of stenosis in the literature out there are very low. So as long as you sharply come through it, um, the nasal lacrimal duct is usually, usually fine. So you have kind of three options depending on kind of how much uh, exposure you need, whether nasal lacrimal ducts involved or not. And I hope that sort of answers that, uh, that question. So as we were saying here, we, uh, you've now eggshelled and re you've removed the mucosa out the poster wall, you've removed the bone. You're then gonna see a layer of fascia. Once you incise that layer of fascia, you're gonna see a lot of fat. You'll have to dissect through the fat uh, that's there in this pterygopalatine infratemporal fossa region to identify your vessels. The vessels will be, you, is what you'll come to first. So that's where you'll see your internal maxillary artery uh, and its branches. And then behind the internal maxillary artery, the vascular structures will be the, the nerves. That's where you'll see your infraorbital nerve, your vidian, et cetera. So we're here, we're we've removed the bone, we're incising the fascia to expose the contents of that. So just the anatomy here of the pterygopalatine fossa orienting you, here's the coena, here's the maxillary sinus that we've opened, here's the middle turbinate, okay? So this will be the medial pterygoid plate. So we've now removed the bone, removed the fat. You can see the internal maxillary artery coming here and it's gonna give off a number of branches. It's gonna give off a descending palatine branch. It's gonna give off an infraorbital nerve branch. It's gonna give off the sphenopalatine branch, which is gonna become part of our posterior septal artery, which is gonna vascularize our nasal septal flap. It's also gonna give off branches to the middle turbinate and the inferior turbinate. We see just posterior to that, sort of the nerves. We've got V2 coming out of frame and rotundum, and here's the infraorbital nerve. We'll see a branch coming down to the sphenopalatine ganglion. We have the greater palatine nerve heading down, and we have the vidian nerve coming and joining the sphenopalatine ganglion. So here we see a cadaver uh, dissection and image here, just to orient you. This will be the coena down here, the sphenoid sinus here. The back wall of the maxillary sinus has been removed. We've removed the fascia, we removed the fat. Here you can see the internal maxillary artery, the greater palatine nerve, you can see V2 here. And so really getting control of the internal maxillary artery in this approach is key because uh, obviously as a terminal branch of the carotid, if you get into it, um, you'll have a, a tremendous amount of bleeding in your, uh, uh, in your field. And as you guys know, who've worked endoscopically, even a drop of blood 
seems like a shower uh, once it gets on the camera. So you've got to really be careful here. And that's why identifying a lot of this approach or exposures are to identify this internal maxillary artery, to clip it, cut it, and get it out of the way so then you can get back towards behind these neurovascular structures will be that pterygoid wedge to begin doing any drilling that you need to get lateral to the lateral recess of the sphenoid or to the paracellar region or anything like that. But really getting control of this vessel here is key. If you do happen to get into it and you have a tremendous amount of bleeding, um, the first thing you should do, always have, um, like I usually have a large sheet of Xeriform that I've cut into um, a long ribbon or string and I'll use that, it's very moldable to pack the area and just leave that in place and maybe go do something else or work on something else. And that really will help you tamponade it and get control so that you can go back, remove that, go back in, find where the cut ends are to put clips on. Um, but you'll see, you'll have it, anytime you have a tremendous amount of bleeding uh, in uh, the sinonasal cavities, I think uh, using a sheet of zero form or uh, packing like that is, very helpful to help temporize it. Or the best part thing to do is just not get into it in the first place. Um, so that's important there for the, for the vascular control. Another important thing to realize here is obviously if we're gonna clip the internal maxillary artery uh, or one of its terminal branches like the sphenopalatine uh, as it comes across here so that we can get to this area and drill it out, um, we're obviously gonna then have cut the vascular supply to the nasal septal flap on this side. So if you're going to raise a nasal septal flap, um, you're going to have to do it from the opposite side and create a posterior septectomy to come across over or things like that. Just things to be aware about as you're planning your approach um, and uh, as you move forward. So let's do a case here. We're doing an approach to the lateral sphenoid recess. This is sort of one of the most basic transpterygoid approaches. It's something hopefully some of you guys have seen and some of you guys will see um, in, in your residencies. So this is gonna be a lateral recess uh, sphenoid encephalocele. Just to orient everyone as we get started, this is a T2 uh, MRI, coronal MRI. This will be the nasopharynx back here. This is our right sphenoid sinus, the left sphenoid sinus, okay? And this is the lateral recess of the sphenoid. So will be the medial pterygoid plate and the lateral pterygoid plate coming out here. So basically, as you can see here, we have a defect here. Some of the middle cranial fossa brain has protruded, the encephalocele uh, has come through and it is into the sphenoid cavity. We see fluid here, that's the CSF leak. So we obviously need to get back and approach here to access where the defect is to close it. Key thing to note is I'm gonna show you what it looks like with us just having done a standard sphenoidotomy. And you'll basically see that you can not see the encephalocele or barely see it. And so that's why removing that pterygoid wedge, that bone here and getting lateral is gonna be key for us being able to access that. So we'll go ahead and start this video. So here's the pre-op T2 MRI. Um, here is the pre-op CT showing the bony defect there laterally. Here's our left sphenoid cavity. So here we've opened up the maxillary and the, um, the maxillary sinus down here. We're opening up the ethmoid and sphenoid there um, widely. And so you can see we can't really uh, get a great uh, view of it. So now we are going to uh, open up uh, we're removing the mucosa overlying the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. We've eggshelled that bone and we're now removing it with a curette. So now we're removing the bone over the posterior maxillary. And so here you can see, this is what I was talking about, the fascia. So once you've incised that fascia, um, you'll get to some fat. Now what I'm carefully doing here is with a ball tip probe is dissecting the um, internal maxillary artery there. And once I've dissected that, I'm going to place some clips. I'll then be able to incise that and move it uh, out of the way. 
So I've incised it, I've moved it out of the way, and now I've begun drilling. That was me drilling that pterygoid bone there. And so now as I drill that, you can start to see this encephalocele is coming into view, right? And so that's what we're gonna start kind of resecting this encephalocele with a, a bipolar cautery. So you can see here, this is the bone that we've drilled out here. This was our normal opening into the sphenoid, and this is the lateral recess now. And so we're seeing, getting to our defect, but you can still see there's still a little bit of the defect that's unexposed. So we're gonna drill out some more here, drill out that pterygoid bone um, even more laterally so we can further expose it. And so now I've got a whole view. I can see all the way around uh, the bony defect. And so I now I've placed a small piece of cartilage as an inlay graft right there here. So I can see clearly around the whole thing. And I've moved my nasocephal flap from the opposite side uh, into place to cover my kind of cartilage that I had placed as the inlay there. But you can see how now I can see clearly around the whole thing. So. Here's the pre-op MRI, obviously, with the encephalocele, and here's the post-op MRI, right? We've drilled out this bone here. We've, this is my nasocephal flap enhancing here uh, that we've gotten rid of that lateral recess encephalocele. So we'll kind of, the last kind of thing that we'll talk about here is an approach to the paracellar kind of cavernous sinus. So what's really important to, you know, one of the main things obviously to know in skull based surgery is the anatomy of the carotid artery because that's obviously one of the things where you'll have your most devastating complications if you don't. So we're all kind of in residency, familiar with doing neck dissections, and we're familiar with this sort of first part of the carotid, the sort of just what we view as sort of this vertical carotid artery. But as it heads here intracranially, it turns sharply and becomes the horizontal petrous carotid. And this will be the carotid component that is just posterior to the eustachian tube. As it comes here to foramen lacerum is where it'll turn again and head straight upwards. And this will be known as sort of what we'll call the clival carotid. And this is what we've sort of, in all those cadaver images we were showing in the beginning when we were showing the sphenoid, this is, what we, this is the portion that we're seeing. We're seeing the vertical clival carotid. It then, as I was saying, comes towards you anteriorly, then moves up, and then posteriorly intracranially. And this is sort of the paracellar uh, carotid, and all of this will be referred to sort of as the kind of cavernous carotid. And the first branch off of it, we showed you in that cadaver specimen, would be the ophthalmic uh, artery there. And then in that, it continues as the anterior cerebral artery. And we showed you in that craniopharyngioma resection, sort of the a1 section, which is before the anterior communicating, and then we showed you the anterior communicating, and then the A2 section of the anterior cerebral artery. That was in that supercellular craniopharyngioma video. So the key portion to recognize here is, you know, we want to know it's, there's a bony covering here. So this sort of horizontal petrous portion, and then where it turns into this vertical clival portion right here at frame and lacerum. And the vidian nerve is going to go back right over this area at foramen lacerum. So it's going to give us, if we follow that vidian, it's going to give us where this turn is to help us identify the carotid. And this is really important. You know, uh, the other day we were doing a petrous uh, chondrosarcoma where we had to drill out the carotid between the eustachian tube and the carotid. And so that vidian nerve really helped give us this carotid and allowed us then to drill this out and mobilize and get behind this, right? So you can see how as we're coming in this paracellar region that knowing that carotid anatomy is important. So it's just something to, to, to know there. So here we're looking back into the uh, a cadaver specimen. We've got our common sphenoid here. Here's our cella floor. Right, this will be the clivus that we're talking about. Here's the cella, the, the pituitary gland. This was the supercellar region that we had ex explored. And here's that vertical clival carotid. It's gonna come towards us, up, and then back in, okay? And that's gonna be the kind of, as you can see, the paracellar carotid. And all of this area here is what we're gonna call kind of the uh, paracellar region. So 
once we've done our medial maxillectomy, as we've shown, we've identified this vidian nerve. This vidian nerve is going to be important. We're going to drill around this, and this is going to lead us back to show us where this clival carotid then turns, because this vidian nerve is going to cross right over it. So this is just another example showing you. Here's the horizontal petrous carotid. It turns up into the vertical clival carotid, and the vidian nerve at foramen lacerum here is going to cross right over that. Okay, so Here's in the cadaver again, okay? This is the vertical clival carotid. This is gonna be the horizontal petrous carotid. And this is the vidian nerve, as we've drilled it back, kind of going right over that area. So in a poorly pneumatized sinus where maybe you don't clearly see the clival carotid, uh, this is a very helpful landmark to drill back to, to, to get there. Now, just going over some basic paracellar anatomy, we see here, here's the sphenoid sinus on either side, the inner sinus septum. We've talked about the pituitary gland, the pituitary stalk, the ophthalmic artery. But this is the cavernous sinus here. We can see the carotid artery there heading back. Just below the carotid artery, within the contents of the cavernous sinus, is the abducens nerves, or cranial nerve six, okay? So here we can see cranial nerve six, is the one that is actually in the cavernous sinus. The remaining nerves are in the side wall. You can see here the third nerve, oculomotor, the fourth nerve, the trochlear nerve, and then V1 and V2. And those are all in the side wall of the cavernous sinus. So understanding that anatomy, cavernous sinus is important. You know, you can have some pituitaries or meningiomas that then head into this medial portion of the uh, cavernous sinus and uh, uh, can be removed. So that's important to know. So this was the initial um, cadaver image we had showed when we were talking about the cellar anatomy, just to go over it again, got the clivus, the cella floor, the tuberculum, the planum sphenoidale, got the optic nerves on either side, the carotid, this is the vertical carotid, the clival carotid, then heading towards us up and then back in as the paracellar carotid. The double asterisks are the lateral OCR and the medial OCR here. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at this paracellar region, sort of right in this area. So once we remove the bone overlying this area, this is what you're left with. So here you have the vertical clival carotid, and then this will be the paracellar carotid. And you can see right next to that carotid is the abducens nerves, or cranial nerve six. And then lateral to that, in the lateral wall, this is cranial nerve three. Behind cranial nerve six in the lateral wall will be cranial nerve four, and then V1 and V2. So this is just a kind of a brief, you know, when you guys have a anatomy labs or cadaver labs, you know, try doing some of these dissections where you drill out the carotid, expose the cavernous sinus uh, to see this anatomy because it's uh, pretty unique. And um, with that, here's some of the sources for the images and things I used. I'll stop. I know that was a lot of information, um, but we'll take any questions. And I guess if there are none, then uh, we'll uh, end it there. And I think you guys have, uh, there's another lecture to start at 10 o'clock, but uh, I appreciate your guys' time and uh, Hope this was informative and gave you guys a little bit of information on uh, the uh, different endoscopic approaches to uh, the skull base. Thank you. That was really great. I always learn a lot from these. I'm ready right. to take boards again. <laughs> and River is ready too. So. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Have a good one. You do. Bye.